actually, before I came here, I was in New Jersey for a long time, and I gave this a lecture was a similar topic uh, about 20, 30 years ago, you know, and at that time the list of diseases you can get from ticks was very, very short. I think there were only three or four on the list then. Nowadays the CDC has a list of tick-borne illnesses which is uh, more than a page long, so it's probably close to 20 diseases you can catch, catch there. Of course the topic is very timely right now since we are in full-blown tick season here and we had already our first couple of patients in the hospital. The first one actually was admitted already at the end of March, when nobody was thinking about the ticks. And of course, each time I go in my backyard, I come back with some ticks nowadays, and you all probably have had ticks exposed already, so it's a big problem. Um, now this just shows that these ticks are sometimes pretty tiny, especially the very tiny ones um, in you know, the different stages of the tick development. We go into that a little bit later. But they easily missed until they engorge after drinking your blood. Now, th there are th three important ticks we'll discuss today, which are here in this area. The American dog tick at the bottom is the one which is found throughout the United States. The, the Lone Star tick is pretty prominent in this area. And the one on the top, the black-legged tick or deer tick, uh, became very famous because it's the agent which transmits Lyme disease. But there are many other diseases which uh, can be attributed to that deer tick as well. Oops, I'm going too fast here. So here is a schematic drawing of those ticks, how they look. Now, of course, since they're pretty tiny, those prominent markings you see on this, you might not actually see it when you have a tick on yourself. So they're not really that easy to distinguish. And as you see, they have uh, basically four stages. There's a little larva here. Let's see. Then they become nymphs. And then these are the adults. The males are smaller than the females. And the females often look somewhat more pretty. For example, Lone Star Tick has this characteristic star there, this white spot on the back, but you only see it in the female. And this here shows the distribution of those ticks we mentioned. The dog ticks are not outlined here because they are found throughout the United States. And I mean, there are different kinds of dog ticks, actually, not just one kind. Um, the light brown area shows, uh, oops, uh, shows here in this color where the deer tick is distributed. It goes all the way here. And of course, here where we are here in this area, so we're in the area of the deer tick as well as of the uh, lone star tick. As the lone star tick has a little smaller distribution, doesn't go all the way up to the upper northeast states there. And the, on the green there's some tick at the west coast only, which also transmits Lyme disease, the so-called uh, Pacific tick here, uh, which we don't see in this area, of course. This is your close-up view of the deer tick. And there's a long list of those infections you can get from the deer tick. Lyme disease, of course, and some other ones um, which we'll talk about, um, including bartonellosis, which I won't go into it, and then ehrlichiosis, uh, but only this one called Ehrlichia muris-like agent, which you probably haven't heard about, and that's something pretty new, which is not found in this area either. So you don't have to worry too much about it. The lone star tick uh, is very prompt in this area, more so than the deer tick probably. And it transmits the uh, so-called early kiosis, which uh, we probably here in this hospital uh, see most often as tick-borne illness. Then there's some disease called stari, which we talk about a little bit later, which was first described in Missouri. Uh, then we find tularemia, Q fever, and something pretty recent is the so-called heartland virus. But we we'll go into those a little bit later. The American dog tick is important for transmitting Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and tularemia as well. So tularemia can be transmitted by different ticks, actually. This shows the life cycle of the ticks. Again, you see this uh, picture I showed before, which is basically 
the uh, black-legged tick or the deer tick, but the other ticks have a similar life cycle actually, goes over th a two-year period. Of course, it starts with the egg here in the spring, then it develops into a larva, which is pretty tiny, has only four legs, or I mean six legs, I mean, and then eventually develops into a nymph. The nymph is the one which causes most of the infections we're talking about. And so the season for getting it from the nymphs is here outlined in gray here. Goes from the spring into the summer. And um, of course in the winter we get a break. Then the nymph develops into the adult tick, the female and the male here. And then eventually they produce the eggs in the spring and the cycle can start again. Um, now, tick-borne illnesses could be bacterial, could be viral, even parasitic. Um, these are the typical bacterial infections. Lyme disease is caused by a bacterium ca uh, called a spirochete. So it actually looks similar to what we see with syphilis. It's, it's also a spirochete. It looks like a corkscrew. And then there's another agent which causes a picture very similar to Lyme disease called Borrelia miyamotoi. That's uh, something relatively new found mainly in the New England states uh, initially described on the other in ticks in Japan. That's why the strange name. Uh, Starry, that's what I mentioned before on the Lone Star tick. Uh, we don't really know what the agent actually is. They suspected some Borrelia, but they never proved it really. Uh, so at this point, we don't even know what it responds to doxycycline. So it seems to be some bacterium. Tularemia, um, bactinolosis is disease typically found actually in cats otherwise. Tick-borne relapsing fever is also a spirochete uh, which we don't find in this area. Um, now cat seal infections are basically also bacterial infections but it's a subgroup of bacteria which are obligate intracellular organisms that means they cannot grow outside uh, the cells. For example they cannot grow in on a normal plate where you grow bacteria, it has to be grown in tissue culture if you want to attempt to actually grow that organism. And they only respond to certain antibiotics like doxycycline, for example, but they won't respond, for example, to rosefin or some other cephalosporins or penicillins. Um, Broccoli mounds for the fever, of course, is the one we grew up with, and that causes a typical skin rash. Ehrlichiosis, we see much, be probably more common in this area, which typically does not have a rash, although at times it can actually. Anaplasmosis is very similar to ehrlichiosis. Q fever, we mentioned. Rickettsia parkeri, it's, it's something pretty rare. And the other one, 364D rickettsiosis, also caused supposedly by Rickettsia philippi, but that's the preliminary nomination there. Those are find, found at the west coast, and they're pretty rare, really. Uh, there are a couple of viral infections, and actually the list of viral infections is growing rapidly. Colorado tick fever, there is something called tick-borne encephalitis, um, which is more a problem really actually in, in Europe and Asia than here. Povassan disease, you might not have heard that name before. That's basically found more in the area of the Great Lakes. Heartland virus, of course, became famous in the last few years. There are only a few cases. We had one case here last year. Um, and bourbon virus disease is the very newest one. There's only actually one, one human case so far reported. And they have not identified really from which tick that bourbon virus is coming, but they suspect it's also from the Lone Star tick, but we don't know for sure really. Um, then there's the one parasitic disease actually which looks like uh, malaria on the smear here almost. These are red cells and you see all these, oops, these intracellular little things there. You know, malaria would look very similar. Um, but again, that's uh, something we see mainly in the northeast of the United States and causes hemolytic anemia. Tick paralysis is actually not an infection, but certain ticks can occasionally produce a toxin, uh, exclusively found in egg-laden female ticks, and mostly in the American dog tick. It's really reported mainly in the Pacific Northwest, in the Rocky Mountain states, 
and not really in this area. Uh, the treatment there is really to find the tick and remove it, and then those uh, symptoms of paralysis go away. So it's a kind of strange disease, but if you find it, it's pretty dramatic. That's removal of the tick will resolve all the symptoms. Um, uh, here's some other virus, Colorado tick fever is called by some RNA virus called cultivirus. It's basically found also in the west, in the Rocky Mountains, the west Black Hills, the west coast are usually at higher elevations in the mountains, caused by the, transmitted by the wood tick. And there are a couple hundred cases every year, actually it's not really that uncommon in those areas. Cause fever, headaches, muscle aches, five to 10 percent come down with neurological problems, meningitis or encephalitis. And if you look at the blood work, they have a low white count, thromocytopenia, as well as an inflammation in the liver. For Vassen virus, I mentioned that before, it's named after a town in Ontario where it was first found in ticks in 1958. The first cases uh, reported here in the United States was uh, in Minnesota or Wisconsin, that area. And uh, there they find basically about 10 cases a year or so. It's a flavivirus in exotic sticks. Exotic sticks is the same one, you know, as a deer tick, for example. So uh, it's found in, in small mammals like raccoons, skunks, and uh, it's not found in this region here. Again, it causes mainly encephalitis and meningitis besides headaches and fever. And this has actually sometimes a high mortality, which can be up to 60%. I don't know if you can read it at the bottom, that color. And there's no specific treatment, of course, for this virus. So stay away from those ticks. Heartland virus, we just mentioned. Actually, it's not nine cases, but 10 cases. First described here in Missouri. Um, and um, just in the last uh, couple of years, first two cases in 2009. And most cases, as, as, as you see there from Missouri, one from Tennessee, the case we had here came from Oklahoma, Grove, Oklahoma. And again, the patients presented with low white count and low platelets. Diarrhea can be sometimes pretty prominent as well. The bourbon virus, the newest one on the list, here's an, probably a picture on the Electron microscope looks almost like a Ebola virus to me. So <laughs> it's a kind of elongated virus. Belongs uh, to something called Togoto virus, um, which is pretty rare. Has not been really described in humans in the United States until this one case here in Kansas. Mm. Bourbon County is in the area of uh, Fort Scott, so it's not really that far away from here. And that particular patient um, died eventually, presented like, you know, someone who might have had Rocky Mountain's body fever, had a skin rash as well, but did not respond to doxycycline, and so they checked him for heart and virus that came back negative, but then they found that it had some cytopathic effect. There was some other virus present, and they identified as this to go to virus. Babesiosis, uh, I mentioned, showed you before the picture of the red cells, which looks as if they're infected with uh, malaria. It's called by Babesia microti. Again, it's transmitted by the deer tick, but it also can be transmitted from blood transfusions. Uh, it's, the reservoir is the white-footed mice. You find it mainly in the northeast as well as in the Great Lake regions. Uh, it causes, of course, fever intermittently similar to malaria, fatigue, headaches, and muscle aches. It causes hemolytic anemia and also low platelets as well. Uh, it affects mainly people who have no spleen. So if you are splenectomized, you might be at risk to get pretty sick from this. And it can be found on the blood smear, but there's also some PCR tests as well. Here that how it looks, at the different stages of, of this parasite. Um, this one you see a quite typical, it's Maltese cross. If you see that, that's, you see that not with malaria, but with this babesiosis. But if you see those ring forms, oops, like down there, you know, that looks definitely very similar to malaria. It's found in different animals, can also, similar disease 
found in horses and cows even, so it's a more veterinary problem in some areas. The tick-borne relapsing fever um, presents as giving high fevers every three, for three days, then you are fine for seven days, and then the fever comes back. So you have headaches, myalgias, chills, and arthralgias. And um, it's found basically at the, in the western United States only. Uh, you get it from sleeping in rodent-infested mountain cabins. There's um, a picture. Can you see it? Uh, see this, you see this little thing here? That's the spirochete, uh, which causes disease. So that's how you make the diagnosis, looking at the blood smear. You have to do it when they have fever. And if they're febrile, you don't find them in the blood. So they come only off and on into the bloodstream, cause the fever, and make people sick. And it's treated similar to, uh, similar to um, syphilis, you know, which wants to rosefin, for example penicillin drugs. Um, now we come to Lyme disease. Everyone talks about Lyme disease. And there are people who diagnose Lyme disease here in the state of Missouri all the time as well. In my opinion, the opinion of Dr. Zymet, you know, who moved to Wisconsin now, uh, we think in this area we really don't see it at all. So, But in any case, its report according to the state statistics is present here in Missouri as well, but it's typically found um, up here, as you see, in northeast states, um, down to Maryland, and then here in the Great Lake regions, here's the area of uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota, mainly in those areas. So Dr. Zamet will see plenty of Lyme disease now, finally. Now, it's, of course, you see a few spots also uh, in our area here, but Definitely, it's, it's probably often also misdiagnosed as well in this area. So it's called, transmitted by the deer tick, Exodus scapularis. Now, when you test for it, you order the antibody test, so-called EIA or IFA. EIA stands for, um, what does it stand for? It's um, enzyme um, immunoassay or IFA immune fluorescent antibody test. And if that one is positive, then they do a confirmatory test. So the antibody test, EIA or IFA, is, is just a screening test which can give many false positive results. So it cross reacts with different other things. And then you do for confirmation the Western blood test. And they can test there for the IgG and the IgM antibody. Now the IgM antibody is the one which initially the body forms to, to a new exposure to an invading organism, um, but on the other hand, the IgM antibody is not that specific either. There's also more chance to get a false positive test. Then usually within a couple of weeks, then the body switches over from IgM to IgG, and that uh, test is more diagnostic. So the IgM test uh, should not really be done in someone who has symptoms for a long time, over 30 days, because at that time, you should really expect to have the IgG antibody and not the IgM antibody. Um, I have seen situations, you know, where people had a positive Western blood IgM antibody, and of course the screening test was positive, but they did not have Lyme disease, you know. After four weeks, you really shouldn't find the IgM positive here and the negative IgG. It should be just the reverse. So if you get that constellation or of positive IgM and negative IgG after more than four weeks of illness, then it's typically a false positive test. The uh, Lyme disease has uh, different stages. The early localized form in the first uh, three to 30 days, so you can become sick pretty quickly within a few days of the tick exposure. And the, the hallmark is the so-called erythema migrans rash. It looks like this here looks, you know, it shows often some clearing in the center, it can give you the so-called bullseye rash. And uh, so that's um, not only found in Lyme disease, but it's, once you see it, you definitely think of Lyme disease, but it also found, for example, with the so-called starry, which we show in a moment. So, you know, it gives you fever, fatigue, headaches, muscle aches, joint pains, and you might get swollen lymph glands as well. 
Uh, then there's the early disseminated disease, uh, which develops usually within the first couple of weeks. You can get additional skin lesions of the erythema migrans. Um, you can sometimes get neurological findings. Bell's palsy is, is not uncommon. It's relatively benign. You can get aseptic meningitis. Um, but typically you can get severe arthritis in the large joints, like the knees, the shoulders. You can get uh, infection of the heart, myocarditis, and typically a heart block. So if you do an EKG, you will see that there's a heart block present. So if someone has Lyme disease, it's sometimes good to take an EKG and make sure they don't have a heart block. The late disease uh, happens then years later sometimes, typically in people who have not been treated for the early disease because the diagnosis was missed there. They can get very disabling arthritis and chronic neurological deficits, uh, for example, severe neuropathy, and also it can affect their memory. And that form is a little bit more difficult to treat. Um, there are, these are the agents which ca can use for treating Lyme disease, so it not only responds to doxycycline, but also to cephalosporins, for example, and amoxicillin. The first three drugs listed, they can be given orally, and then IV, ceftriaxone, or rocephin is frequently used as well to treat Lyme disease. Um, so if you just have a tick bite and you live in a Lyme disease infested area, then some people recommend to take prophylactically doxycycline just one time at 200 milligram dose. Um, that's a little bit controversial. On the other hand, you know, uh, if, if you really have a strong suspicion you might be coming down with Lyme disease and you don't want to avoid it, that definitely is something which works. It's not recommended for any other tick-borne illness actually to do it if prophylaxis, for example, for ehrlichiosis or or Rappimans body fever. It's not officially recommended, although some people probably would still give it, but there's no definite proof that actually the prophylaxis would work, this one both. If you have only the, the skin rash, the erythema migrans, then you just can take an oral regimen. You don't need the intravenous ceftriaxone, and typically give it for 10 to 14 days, doxycycline 10 days, the amoxicillin or other cephaloporins for two weeks. If you have neurological disease like meningitis, for example, you might want to give intravenous ceftriaxone. If you have just uh, balls, palsy, then it's not actually that such a severe disease. You can get away with an oral regimen for two weeks, actually. If you have cardiac disease like heart block, then uh, it can be either treated orally or intravenously. If the patient asks, well, you probably would give the intravenous for seven, and you treat for two weeks. If you have severe arthritis, um, usually more in the late stage diseases, then you treat for actually a whole month. Um, and if people have recurrence after you treat them with oral medication, that can happen occasionally, then you would give them two weeks of IV recephin. Uh, now there's something called post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome that happens in 10 to 20 percent of people who have been treated for Lyme disease and they have symptoms lasting sometimes for years with vague complaints of muscle aches, joint pains, memory loss, problem with sleeping, generalized fatigue. Um, that's a real entity, although there's also some overlap probably with chronic fatigue syndrome there. So how much you can attribute it to Lyme disease is sometimes difficult to say. Some people speculate that it's maybe some autoimmune disease, definitely treating them again for Lyme disease with antibiotics doesn't really do anything for this. So there's, there's no presence of any uh, Borrelia bacteria in your system at that point. But I mean, there's some so-called Lyme experts who concentrate in treating this kind of disease with rocephin for months and months, for example. STARI, it stands for Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness. It also has been called Masters disease because Dr. Masters was the one who first described it here in Missouri. Uh, the lone star tick is the vector. It can cause uh, the same skin rash as Lyme disease, but usually less prominent. Um, and we don't know the etiology for sure. Uh, Borrelia lone star was some proposed name for the agent, which never was proven to be there. So the symptoms are similar to Lyme disease, but not as severe. People have fevers, headaches. They might have stiffness of the neck, myalgias, arthralgias, and they seem to respond to doxycycline. 
Porky Bond's body fever. It's of course a dreaded illness caused by rickettsia, rickettsi E, found in the, transmitted by the American dog tick. And then the Rocky Mountains, there's a wood tick which can transmit it as well. Um, it's not really that much found in the Rocky Mountains, although it's there as well. After about five to 10 days of a tick bite, people become sick. Interestingly, this rickettsia has a propensity to infect endothelial cells, which means it can cause some kind of vasculitis, can cause, again, severe headaches, muscle aches, joint pains, and the typical rash. Uh, which usually starts after two to five days, starts centripetally, that means, oops, it is, uh, starts in the periphery and then spreads to the trunk, so it starts in hands and feet, for example, and is attributed to actually the vasculitis. Um, here that's how the rash looks. It um, doesn't, might, doesn't have necessarily to look as prominent, but it can then also, of course, spread to the trunk as well. And here's the distribution of Rocky Mountain's body fever. So it's, although it's found in the West in Rockies, it's mainly found in the Eastern United States. Um, and as you see, our area here is more or less at the epicenter. And then here, Tennessee has a high number of cases. The highest number of cases are actually found in Oklahoma, here next door. But Missouri is right, uh, number two in the nation, probably with cases of Rocky Mountain's body fever. And ehrlichiosis, uh, that's the disease we diagnose not infrequently here at Freeman. Ehrlichia chaffiensis is the main agent causing this. There are some other ehrlichias which you only find rarely. One is called Ehrlichia ewingii, um, which uh, mainly has a propensity to infect uh, neutrophils, granulocytes. It's also comes from the Lone Star Tick and is found mainly in immunocompromised patients here in Missouri, Oklahoma, Tennessee. Um, uh, we see on the other end, uh, you know, there's another agent called EMLA. There's some Ehrlichia muris, uh, and this agent is similar to that one. Comes from deer ticks, not from the Lone Star Tick, and infects monocytes, similar to the Ehrlichia chaffiensis. And this one is mainly found where Dr. Zamet is now in Minnesota and Wisconsin, in that area of the Great Lakes. Um, the Ehrlichia chaffiensis itself infects monocytes, not the granulocytes in the blood. And it's transmitted by Lone Star Tick here. The main reservoir is the white-tailed deer. And its distribution, I think I have a, have a map there somewhere, right? No, that's the wrong one. There we go. That's Ehrlichia chaffiensis. Again, as you see, uh, we are right here, more or less, where you see most of the cases, but it goes all the way up the East Coast. So definitely it's prominent in our area here. And the incubation period can be as long as two weeks. Uh, here are the symptoms. Again, kind of non-specific. Fever, chills, headaches, muscle aches. Occasionally can have a rash as well. I mean, it used to be called spotless Rocky Mountain spot fever, but if you find a, a mild rash, it's, it's compatible with ehrlichiosis as well, not just Rocky Mountain spot fever. Here you see a monocyte in the blood smear, and then you see this little dark dot here. That's called the morula. That's it's an agglomeration of of the rickettsia, you know, these bacteria which cause ehrlichiosis. So they multiply with vacuoles of those monocytes and can be picked up on the blood smear if you look for it and have experience. It's not the most sensitive test to diagnose is 25% sensitivity. So if you look for it, you might actually find it. More useful is actually a PCR test on whole blood, uh, which is again not 100% sensitive, uh, but it's a very good test here. We often, of course, order a so-called tick panel, which looks for antibodies. Um, but the antibodies, of course, usually take two weeks or at least a week before they will show up. So early on, the tick panel will not be helpful. The treatment, again, is doxycycline, typically for um, uh, about a week or so, up to 14 days. There is no reason to give it longer than that. Occasionally, there's a situation where someone thinks they have 
had a tick-borne illness and they are pregnant, in that case, you should not give doxycycline, you know. Yes? What's PCR? It's polymerase chain reaction. That's one of those fancy tests we do nowadays in the laboratory. Thanks for asking. And in those situations, you could give rifampin as an alternative. Um, Fenicol might possibly work too, but that's probably a drug you don't want to give, especially orally. Rifampin by itself is rarely used because it can often lead to resistance pretty quickly, but in this situation where I give it only for a period of time, and someone who's pregnant would be something you could probably use. Another ehrlichiosis is called anaplasmosis. It's called also HDA, human granulocytic anaplasmosis, because it infects the, the granulocytes. As you see on this picture here, that's uh, neutrophil. And again, you see this little black dot here, so-called morolag, and agglomeration of those rickettsia in the vacuole of that white cell. Um, it's transmitted uh, by a different tick, not the lone star tick, but Ixodes capillaris or deer tick. And that's also why it's, the distribution is different than the Ehrlichia shafiensis. I think I have a map here, there we go. So it's, it's more in those areas where you also find Lyme disease, you know, along the north east coast here and up again in here in the Great Lake region, Wisconsin and Minnesota. But as you see, it also can be occasionally found in our area as well. So Oklahoma, Arkansas and so on. But uh, um, let's see, it's, it doesn't say how it's diagnosed here, but again, you can do a PCR test for this organism. And it's the reservoir is not the deer, but small rodents, like again, skunks and opossums, for example. Um, it again causes fever, myalgia, unusually to get a rash with it. Typically does not cause meningitis, like Ehrlichia sometimes does. Um, and it's less severe than Ehrlichiosis, but can occasionally cause Bell's palsy. Uh, yes, you, you know, as we said, you can find it on the blood smear, and it's actually more sensitive, the blood smear here, than for Ehrlichiosis. But there's again a PCR test and the test for antibodies as well. Treatment is the same as for the other tick-borne illnesses with uh, doxycycline. Tularemia, we see occasionally, we usually have a couple of cases every year in this hospital, called by Francisella tularensis. It's highly uh, contagious, you only need 10 or 15 bacteria to cause infection actually. Uh, the main reservoir is small mammals, typically rabbits, it's called, also called rabbit fever find it in squirrels, voles, mice even. And if you had a tick bite causing it, you will find some skin ulcer, high fever. It causes severe swelling of the lymph glands, headaches, and makes you quite sick, you know, with high fever and so on. Now you can also get it otherwise, uh, not from ticks, but be exposed, for example, to rabbits when you hunt. So hunters get it, for example. And uh, depending on the port of entry, it can cause different forms. You know, if it causes skin ulcer, it's called ulceroglandulobic glandular because it causes the lymph glands to swell. Occasionally, it can rub the bacteria into your eye and get severe conjunctivitis, and then from there, swollen glands, and it's called ocular glandular. Sometimes it just has swollen glands, then it's glandular. It can start in the throat. That's more, I assume, if you, you eat it somewhere from maybe poorly cooked rabbits or something, I'm not sure. Typhoidal, that means that you just have people with high fevers and no obvious uh, other source, and you can, in those situations, grow it actually from the bloodstream. It can cause pneumonia either by inhaling it or by having a bloodstream infection, which causes then pneumonia. So there's a serological test and a PCR test as well as the blood culture. If you grow it in the blood culture, uh, then you have to warn the laboratory that because they could get a laboratory acquired infection from this growing it, inhaling it from the plates. The treatment is doxycycline again, but also cipro, gentamicin, sometimes a combination of those. So it's um, a little more difficult to treat, has to be treated for at least two weeks, um, better up to three weeks. Here's the distribution of tularemia, 
Again, our area is here heavily involved, but it's found actually all over the United States. Um, here in Missouri, you know, we don't find that much Lyme disease, as I mentioned before. There's no case of bourbon virus reported so far here, but you know, Kansas is pretty close here, so we might maybe eventually find bourbon virus disease as well here. Uh, the main agents here is ehrlichiosis and Rocky Mountain spotted fever and occasionally, of course, tularemia as well. Actually, here are the statistics in, Mis in Missouri for the last couple of years. Ehrlichiosis, uh, up to 400 cases a year. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, usually in the range of 300 per year. Tularemia, only 20 to 35 there. Lyme disease, as you see, is reported here very rarely, and some of them might have been misdiagnosed, actually. So. And um, now all the tick-borne infections, uh, you know, have similar presentation, actually. So clinically, it's very difficult to make a diagnosis if you see a patient. They all run with fever, typically. They feel tired and weak. They have muscle aches, joint pains, headaches, nausea, sometimes diarrhea. Some of them have rashes, of course, mainly with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. If you do blood work, they have low white count, and uh, the clue is very important is here the, oops, is the thrombocytopenia. Um, and often you find inf inflammation of the liver. They have elevated transaminases, you know, as well. I just saw a case, a patient presented initial initial hospital with high fever, and they found multiple ticks on him and he had a low platelet count, but he also had urinary uh, tract infection, you know, he had a, an obstructive, uh, pro obstructing prostate and he required a folic catheter, he wasn't renal failure. So they concentrate on the urinary tract infection and treat him for that. They had sent out the tick panel, so they had the right thinking there, but they did not bother to treat him for any tick-borne illness, you know, so the guy eventually ended up here in our hospital because he was getting sicker and sicker. And they put him on doxycycline and he got better within two days. He was pretty confused when he came up here. They didn't do a spinal tap, he had some nuclear rigidity, so he probably had some aseptic meningitis as well. Um, so the clue is here, number one, uh, look for the low white count and the thrombocytopenia. Number two, make sure you ask them for any outdoor activity, possibly tick bites. You know, if you get that history and the person is sick, you better put them on doxycycline and then sort out things later on, you know, get, of course, a tick panel, check them with the PCR for Olympia, and then you're on the right track. So, any questions? Yes? Um, if you have, on the bullet eye, when you talked about the bullet eye for when a tick bite with a tick bite, do you suggest treating at that point? Because a lot of times parents will say, oh, that's just an allergic reaction to a tick bite. Would if you suggest doxycycline at that? If point? they have the rash, which looks like so-called erythema migrans, you know, uh, then definitely that's the reason to treat them, yes. And now if they're little children, you might be reluctant to give them doxycycline. On the other hand, uh, you know, if you give something like cephalosporin or amoxicillin, it only works for, for Lyme disease, but not for Rocky Mountain spotted fever and for uh, ehrlichiosis, you know, so doxycycline is still the drug of choice, even in small children. Now in children, you know, you didn't like to give doxycycline because it can cause discoloration of the teeth. So if they're young, they might end up with yellow teeth. On the other hand, if you give it just for a short period of time, like here of maybe seven to 10 days, actually they have done studies in children who had been on doxycycline and they really found that a short course of doxycycline does not cause any staining of the teeth. So in those children, I would not hesitate to give them doxycycline actually. On the other end, you know, if they had a tick bite and no symptoms, I wouldn't give a child doxycycline, you know. <laughs> what yes. causes the heart block? You talked about heart block with... All of the, uh, the What's organism the pathology of, of Lyme disease, the Borrelia, it infects the heart somehow. Uh, because you find it early on, so it's, it doesn't seem to be any kind of immunological problem, you know, but it seems to be direct invasion of the conducting system. But I mean, why it happens, we don't really know, but it seems to have some tropism for the heart somehow. 
how long do the myalgias and those kind of things last? I mean, when you're talking to a patient about you have this problem, how long do you expect for the symptoms to last or when? Or if you put them on doxycycline, they get better within a few days, really. Yeah. So now if they had, uh, you know, late stage Lyme disease and have arthritis, that takes much longer to resolve, you know, but early on, if they have an acute illness, then they respond very well to the antibiotics. So, of course, I didn't address the problem, you know, how to prevent tick bites, you know, stay indoors. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there was one patient, he had no outdoor activity, some pretty obese, middle-aged man, and, um, but he had the habit of sleeping with his dog. And then he was in the hospital pretty sick. He was uh, also presented with thrombocytopenia as one of the clues, and his liver enzymes were elevated. And being in the hospital for a week, the you nurse know, found a tick on him. Mm -hmm. But because he was so obese, they probably didn't check all his skin folds. You know, so. And he was put on doxycycline, and actually his uh, PCR for early care came out positive. So. What about the best way to remove a tick? Some people try to put stuff on them. Oh, no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, try those home remedies, really. Uh, you pull them off very gently. I mean, you can use uh, forceps, you know, tweezers, I mean, and pull. Otherwise, doing it with your hands and grab them very close to the skin works as well, really. But you have to pull very steadily, not too abruptly, so, so that otherwise the head might break off. Uh, on the other end, you know, once you've removed the tick, then it's okay. Concerning the you know, how long does it have a tick to be on you before you become infected? With Lyme disease, it takes at least one and a half days, you know, if the tick is there less than 35 hours, uh, 36 hours, then you can assume you're not infected. If you have, on the other hand, some other infection like Povacin fever, they claim it takes uh, the Povacin virus only 50 minutes to get into your system. So uh, I'm not sure how long it takes for the oligiosis to enter the bloodstream after a tick bite. It's probably more at least a day, I would think, but we don't know for sure. All right, thank you for coming.